to, to our 13th session, our lucky 13th session. We'll be doing more on Fridays and Sundays, soon to be changed to evenings. So I uh, I am turning it over to Ward Parks to start. We'll start our reading and then we'll have the second part as questions and answers and comments from all of you. Take it over, Ward. Okay, well, as you can see, I'll expand so you can see a little better. We're on the uh, 18th of December now. Remember, the first one was the 2nd of December, and the last one will be the 14th of January. We're actually about halfway through, not far from it. And uh, right now, Baba's moving into the topic of evolution. Let me just scroll through a few pages so you can see what we're in for. This was a big one on evolution. Then in the next one, he goes into Sanskaras. That might be as far as we get today. And he continues actually talking about topic of evolution from other points of view. Um, now for this particular talk, uh, it seemed, this was an important one on evolution. Uh, and some of the information that you'll see really, uh, even in God Speaks, believe it or not, some of this content actually found its way into God Speaks. <laughs> you'll, you can find that out in the, uh, uh, these appendixes, the one on evolution explains that. Um, but uh, so some of the unique information that Baba ever gave, uh, he gave here, particularly in this talk. So for this uh, 18th of December, uh, Baba brought this little doll with him, cloth doll, and uh, he used it to illustrate the turns of uh, evolution, which is one of the topics here. Baba uh, explained that uh, every form is actually the human form and that in stone, it's all compacted in upon itself. And then through the course of evolution, the human form goes through a whole series of turns. In, there are five of them until in human form, it's vertical and upright. So the entirety of evolution is a process of the human form unfolding and standing up. Um, so for this talk, as I say, Baba brought this little doll and uh, that dummy, Chanji, should have brought a video camera, but I don't know why he didn't because uh, it's very, very hard to make sense of certain parts of it, particularly what the five turns are. Nowhere is it altogether clear, particularly with the third and fourth turns. You can make guesses about it. But Baba also apparently called in the mandali for this particular talk, which he didn't usually do. So this is a, this is a major one, I would say. Okay, so why don't we just jump in? Who's our first reader? Our first reader is Melissa. All right. What was called the spiritual hour from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. usually featured a lecture by one of the mandali. On this occasion, however, Baba took over this slot himself, summoning the mandali to join the Meher Ashram boys and broaching the subject of evolution. As a pedagogical aid, Baba made use of a cloth doll, which he manipulated into various postures to illustrate the varied forms that the soul assumed in its evolution from stone to human. In the hour that followed, Baba proceeded to explain the plains and the skies. No record of this talk survives in our source manuscripts, however. In, creation and its, in the Creation and Its Causes series, Baba arrives at this topic in his lecture of 27th December. Shall I read the note? Probably it's a good idea. Yeah, just people are warned. Can you, the, is records it, can you read it? the records of this lecture, as they descend to us through the surviving manuscripts, 
contain a number of incongru incongruities and inconsistencies. Probably this was due to errors and omissions in the Mondali note-taking. Since this task entailed recording not just the words that Baba said, but what he demonstrated with the cloth doll. For a full discussion, see Appendix 2. The edited text of it, this particular lecture draws heavily not just on the three explanations manuscripts, but on other sources as well, especially Ramju's explanations in pencil. Okay, let me just, uh, I haven't said much in these sessions about the manuscript background to all of that, because we've got enough to do with reading the talks, but um, in places where the manuscript is, uh, uh, sources seem to be garbled or mixed up or corrupted to a large degree, um, I actually put in some footnotes here. There'll be many other places where manuscript issues are dealt with. That's all in the end note. So if there's actually a footnote, it means the issues are kind of big, which they are here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now maybe we should uh, read, let's see. Huh. Okay, let's let's deal with this chart right now. Even we'll come we'll be more on it later. This is the chart, the stages of evolution, um, stone, metal, vegetable, animal, human. Um, now I don't know if you we did this modeling it after. Uh, darn, I'm not. Yeah, that we modeled it after this one. You remember this one? How the uh, previous session, how the opposites are right next to each other. So uh, we created this chart on the same model. Um, so here is the key to it. You could read that. If you... Yes. Key to figure 24. This simple diagram illustrates the evolutionary process as a circular movement that begins in stone form, almost immediately adjacent to the creator point, that proceeds through metal, vegetative, and animal forms, and that culminates in the human form, once again, back in close proximity to the creator point. Though the explanations manuscripts do not provide this diagram, sources and analogs for it can be found in six other places, always at junctures clearly corresponding to this moment in Baba's explanation on the topic of evolution. So here's one of those you can see. Okay, and now the talk begins. Today, Sri used a cloth doll to illustrate and explain more clearly his discourse on the evolution of form. He began the session underscoring the following. Remember this one point about fishes. Where are their eyes directed? When they dive down in the water, their eyes are turned upwards, a practice quite contrary to that of humans who look down when they dive. The first stage, stone form. Now, the first important form after the commencement of evolution is stone. Though a stone apparently lacks eyes, ears, nose, hands, and feet, and other parts of the human body, in truth they are there, but folded up and compacted in its body to such a degree that they cannot be seen, as illustrated in figure 25. Let's take a moment to look at that figure. By the way, um, there was no source figure although 
the manuscript makes many references to a figure. Either it was never drawn or it got lost. So Nadia and I just came up with this, uh, trying to illustrate the human form going through different postures uh, in the course of evolution. This is that doll that uh, Baba was using. We can probably skip the uh, uh, footnotes. Some of these footnotes deal with uh, textual manuscript issues, but you've been alerted to that. Hmm. Actually, why don't we read this key right now? Maybe that would be a good to, uh, thing to deal with. Oops, what happened? Okay. All right, Here you, can you read that key? Yes, key to figure 25. Although none of the source manuscripts provide an illustration, nonetheless, their text alludes to a figure three times, in a way suggesting that the illustrator was trying to portray the various movements and postures of the human form that Baba was demonstrating to the boys with his cloth doll, as mentioned above. Figure 25 was accordingly created by the artist editor team in an effort to visually depict all of this. Every form in creation, as Baba explained, is nothing other than the human form in varying degrees of manifestation. Between the beginning and the end of evolution, that latent human form achieves vertical upright posture through the course of five turns. Although the information about these five turns. Okay, one second, Henry. Okay. And certain evolutionary forms is incomplete and inconsistent. Figure 25 tries in broad strokes to give some idea of the process as the artist editor team understands it. The various evolutionary forms and corresponding human postures have been ranged in a circular clockwise movement beneath an arc on top representing God beyond and a point representing the creator point. In an overall diagrammatic shape carried over from figure 24. The major stages and forms of evolution in figure 25 were all mentioned by Baba during his 18th December lecture, except for the class of birds, which Baba brought into his evolutionary account a few nights later. So here you see it. So stone, the first turn is the vegetable where the human form is upside down. The second term is to worm where it's horizontal. The third turn leads us to fish, the fourth to bird, and then animal. By animal, Baba seems to mean mammal. Uh, so that's uh, what the diagram is showing. And some of these, certain of these forms have an important role. Crab, the waterfowl, the kangaroo is the first, uh, you know, mammal animal form. Something like the turkey appears to be the last bird form. Bird forms start with waterfowl associated with water coming from fish and conclude with chicken and turkey where the bird form is coming back down to earth again. So Baba is going to start going over uh, all of this. Okay, so we got through the first stage or in the second stage, vegetable form. Okay. Uh, let me get Jim up here. Hold on. Or Jack. How about Jack? Would you like to read for a bit? Sure. Okay. First stage? Second stage. Second stage. The second stage. Vegetable form. Moving on from stone, the latent human form makes its first turn. And arrives skip, at vegetable. Skip the note. Yeah, sorry. And arrives at vegetable as the next.
important form in the evolutionary series. You must have marked the appearance of a tree. Its head is buried underneath the ground. That head has a mesh of hairs in the form of the various fine roots. Its neck appears in the shape of the tree's trunk and the large and small branches are its hands and feet. The smaller branches correspond to the human fingers and toes. Since the tree's head is submerged in the ground, to water it, you pour at the base of the tree so that when the water soaks into the ground, the tree's mouth, which is latent and invisible to the eye, yet still present, amid the head and roots, can reach it and drink it and thus quench its thirst. The third stage, worm form. Worm comprises the next major form. As it progresses from vegetable to worm, the atma making its second turn falls flat on its back with face and eyes turned upwards, as is illustrated in figure 25. Evolution in worm form begins with the smallest green insect. This insect has hands and feet, so minute as to be imperceptible, yet they exist nonetheless. As evolution progresses, the hands and feet increase in size and become more apparent to the observer. This uh, footnote might be worth reading if you can see it, if it's big enough. Yeah. In God Speaks, page 177, Baba referred, re refers to certain species occupying special seats in evolution. These tend to occupy traditional transitional positions between one evolutionary kingdom and the next. This small green insect seems to re represent one of these transitional forms. More are identified later in this lecture and in the lectures following. And for a fuller discussion of these transitional species, see appendix two, especially pages 483 to 86. And I'd like to interject something personally. Uh, the kangaroo uh, I, I, form. We, we not do that. I, we just want okay. to read through, okay? We'll, we'll talk to you later. Thanks. <laughs> no, no worries. Okay. And, okay, where are we? Uh, in the fish form? Oh, in the fish form, as in the worm, the face is turned upwards. And the hands and feet of, of the latent compact human form manifest as fins and tail with which the fish swims, dives, and generally propels itself through the water. There are many species of fish from the smaller to the bigger and the biggest. The third turn begins in worm and continues through fish. And the fourth is inaugurated when the latent human form turns its face downwards again assuming first the form of a crab. Uh, uh, um, Those are no. the uh, Indian words we found. Kekado uh, or Kekra. As the, as the evolving soul progresses on into the animal kingdom, it takes numerous forms. The principal among these being the kangaroo, the dog and the monkey which stands as the last in the series of animal. It should be marked that as evolution advances through the sequence of animal species, our front legs rise up higher and higher as we see in bears and lions until in dog form, the soul can actually sit on its hind legs. And in monkey, which is the last stepping stone in evolution, it can maintain a sitting pose like a human. Such is the evolutionary series then.
from stone to tree, worm, fish, crab, and animal to the human being. Thank you, Jack. Uh, let's see. Marianne, can you pick up? Yes. Returning to a further elucidation on certain stages of the evolutionary journey, <laughs> Shri explained, regarding trees, you might say that just as the human form exhibits two hands and two feet with a fixed number of toes and fingers, a tree ought to manifest the same shape. But there actually is a tree with exactly two branches corresponding to the human arms and hands and two other main branches corresponding to the legs and feet and smaller branches like fingers and toes. In short, the larger and smaller branches of this tree precisely match the limbs of the human body. Moving on from the vegetable kingdom, the first worm form is exactly like a man's, but with its face upwards and its back underneath, and with hands and feet so minute as to be imperceptible to ordinary eyes. But the world of nature does feature a form in which this can be seen clearly the latent human in worm is the reverse of what we find in animal where the face is turned downwards. <clears throat> the evolutionary movement through the fish kingdom progresses through many different kinds and forms as it does through the kingdom of the animals arriving in the end at the human form. The forms I have singled out for special note and explanation to you are among the chief forms and the full tally of even just these chief forms is exceedingly great. Its account totals 84 locks. That is, we find 84 locks of chief species, and many of these have their own major and minor branchings and subspecies and so forth. Maybe we can uh, read that note here. Yes, there's a, there's a note. A lock is a hundred thousand eighty four locks, adds up to eight million four hundred thousand. In God Speaks, Baba says, that the soul passes through this same number of incarnations, paren 84 locks, in the reincarnationary cycle in human form. Evidently, this same number recurs both in the evolutionary descent and in reincarnation. Okay. Resuming our narrative once again, after the series of fish and after the kangaroo, through the various animal forms, the hands and feet and face are turned towards the ground. Until in dog form, the atma can sit up on its hind legs with its front legs resembling hands raised. And from here, evolution progresses to the final monkey form arriving in the end at the form of the human. So to review, in stone form, the hands, feet, eyes, head, etc., of the latent human form are present, but compacted and folded in upon themselves to the point where they cannot be seen. Evolution is complete when these have been completely unfolded and the Atma can stand erect with head up as in the human form. So how many turns take place 
through the course of this evolutionary process. Five in all, four of them forward and one reverse. Okay, so that's the end of that um, lecture. Uh, let me just uh, comment that uh, the textual situation here was really a mess. Um, and uh, <laughs> so anyone who wants to go into that, these endnotes are very, very detailed and they're very, very difficult. One of the, I suspect that some of the problems uh, may come from the fact they're in the West Tank Room still. The Baba hadn't moved to the Samadhi yet. Um, but the, uh, you know, that museum room, those of you remembering Mirabad, the museum room. Um, so they're all there, nighttime, lanterns, a big crowd of kids, a whole bunch of Mandali, and Chanji was trying to take notes, presumably. And um, the thing is, when Baba is showing something with a doll, how do you explain it, you know? You know, Baba's manual agility, he could show something so vividly, but how do you write that down? And before you've succeeded in doing so, Baba has gone on to the next thing. I think that's probably what happened. And it was a great misfortune because uh, a lot of this stuff, Baba never explained again. And all of the things that you'll find, even in God Speaks, believe it or not, is based on this. So there are certain confusions and garblings that never got corrected. Probably this is, it seems that none of the Mandali were actually interested in evolutionary biology or anything of that kind. So we have a, a permanent unresolved set of series of problems in Baba's evolutionary account. And this appears to be uh, where the basic dictation happened, what we just read. Okay. Bob is going to, okay, he's going to change his topic a little bit. He'll be coming back to evolution through the course of this. So this is the next talk, 21st December. By the way, on the 20th, Baba moved to the crypt cabin. Uh, he had been uh, staying down the hill and would come up and give his talks, but now he secluded himself in the crypt cabin. Remember that he had been fasting now for about 40 days. Um, but now he was more or less in seclusion. A few people would come to see him there, uh, but not many. And he would come to the window, um, that window which is still there, uh, the east window of the Samadhi. He would, uh, you know that photograph I've shown you. In fact, let's just take a minute and look at the photograph since right now we're coming to uh, the moment where Baba moved in there. You see that? That's showing. So it was like that. This photograph was taken January 1928. So right at the very time he was giving these talks, um, there was a very cold period in January. And I imagine this was then because of the blanket, which you can see. So Baba began dictating. And there was a little platform uh, where the boys sat in three groups. And there was a kind of a awning overhead. So now we're moving into that stage in this series of talks. Let's see. Okay, do we have a reader? Cassandra, you're muted, I think. I'm not hearing. Oh, anything. I was. I'm sorry. I was muted. Sam. <laughs> Sam, please. Until this time, Baba had been giving his evening lectures to the boys in the West Tank Room in what is today called Mayher Retreat. On 20th December, however, Baba moved his seat from Lower Mehrabad and began to confine himself in the crypt cabin which he never stepped out of from that time until 26 February, 1928. All of the remaining lectures of the crypt cab, um, all, 
All of the remaining lectures in this series, Baba gave through an east window of the crypt cabin, with the boys and other attendees of these talks gathered on a platform that had been built in the space extending to the east. Since the lectures usually began at 7.30 p.m., well after nightfall, the scene had to be lit with lanterns. The Sanskara's theory. When we explain the evolution of species in detail, the whole matter will become clear. But before turning to that, let us come to a proper understanding of the Sanskara's theory. Then the evolution of the species can be easily grasped in figure 26 on the next page. Why don't we, okay. Let's jump over and take a look at it. Okay, do you want to read those? Um, uh, sure. Number in one. fact, let's read the key first so people understand what the colors mean. Okay, so the blue equals unconsciousness, which decreases as the finitude of sanskaras decreases. Yellow equals consciousness, which increases as sanskaras increase from most finite to infinite. And uh, the three red lines, mm. more faint, yeah. um, equal finitude of sanskaras. And the A in the circle equals atma, which never changes. Okay, and then these are the four levels he talks about. Number one, infinite atma in stone form is almost unconscious and has most finite sanskaras. So you see there, um, just to connect what we just read in the key, blue means unconsciousness. So unconsciousness largely prevails. Uh, there, the uh, yellow orange is consciousness, which increases as sanskaras increase. Now you have a little bit of sanskaras and a little bit of consciousness. And the finitude is very heavily pronounced. It's very uh, finite, the consciousness at this point. And at the center is A for Atma, which never changes at all. Okay, so number two, infinite Atma in vegetable form is subconscious and has finite sanskaras and obviously increasing consciousness um, and sanskaras. Hmm. <laughs> number three, infinite Atma in animal form is less subconscious and has finite sanskaras. Less finite. Less finite. Oh. And number four, infinite Atma in human form is conscious and has infinite sanskaras. Okay, why don't we deal with the key right now and then we can get back to the lecture. Okay. Key to figure 26. This figure, the first on the subject of sanskaras, is based on source manuscripts that do not give diagrams as such, but rather carefully lineated text boxes. The information in these text boxes has been exactly reproduced in figure 26 in the left-hand column. The artist editor team <clears throat> has tried to render this information diagrammatically in the right-hand column with a key on the bottom. Each circle represents an evolutionary form in its latent infinite potentiality. Consciousness is captured by sanskaras represented in the yellow portion of each circle which progresses from the most finite as a silver arc to the infinite as the complete circle in the bottom panel. 
The dark blue coloration stands for the unconscious latency, which the sanskaras have not yet illuminated. The red circle tracing the circumference represents the finitude of sanskaras that diminishes through evolution until in the human form, it has disappeared altogether. Atma, unchanged, occupies a position at the center of each circle. Okay, so that's that figure again. So we could go back um, to the very bottom paragraph here. Yeah. The Sanskaras theory, or, or now in stone form? Yeah, now in yes. stone form. Now in stone form, at the outset of evolution, Atma is virtually unconscious. Its consciousness is almost nil. Why so? The knowing is necessarily made most finite because of the limitedness of the form. Okay. Which too is most finite. From this starting point, as in figure 26, we can summarize the progress of evolution thus. In stone form, Atma is almost unconscious with most finite sanskaras. In vegetable form, Atma is subconscious with finite sanskaras. In animal form, Atma is less subconscious with less finite sanskaras. In human form, Atma is conscious with infinite sanskaras. Coming to the point, we can see that in human form, Atma acquired full consciousness. Now, Atma must know itself. Such is the impulsion that drives evolution. Yet despite having arrived at human form, it does not succeed in achieving this. It does not truly know. Why not? Because of its infinite sanskaras. Now, how did it acquire these sanskaras? Because of its evolution from the lower to the higher forms. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, Elizabeth, do you wanna pick up? Sure. For the achievement of this goal, this must happen, that consciousness remains while sanskaras vanish. That is, the Atma must reverse itself, going back by the way it came, while retaining both the human form and full consciousness. One must become like a stone whose sanskaras are most finite, but with the full consciousness proper to the human form. Like stones, realized ones have no desires and care not whether they are kicked or worshipped and revered, though this means a lot to those among the masses of humanity who perform such actions. And God help those unlucky ones who do the former. Again, one must retrace one's steps all the way back to stone form while retraining consciousness. The course of progress in the evolutionary journey must be reversed for the destruction of sanskaras. Why? Figure 27 on the facing page will help to clarify. Okay, 
So just to take a look, I better, uh, but if I, that's what the whole thing looks like. I know it's a little bit too hard to read. So this is the curtain of Sanskaras within the false individuality, figure 27. Um, so the different levels here, Atma, you know, you've seen Atma like this before. And what Baba keeps emphasizing is that Atma never changes. Now, this particular uh, diagram is unusual in that it identifies consciousness with the level of mind. Usually he differentiates. And you have these sanskaras. Beneath this, notice that Baba was talking about gross body, subtle body. Um, he hadn't really introduced or he wasn't consistently introducing the idea of a mental body. So subtle means the entire extent of the inner realm and the uh, parts of the um, human mind and body corresponding to that. So desires and thoughts belong to the subtle body. We did this in black because you may recall the Baba says the subtle is black and the gross is white. Actions are associated with the gross body. And uh, if you could read the key associated with this, this is one of our sources. Key to figure 27. Continuing on the subject of sanskaras, figure 27 shows their role and placement within the structure of the false self. Atma, of course, transcends sanskaras altogether. Mind, which Baba here identifies with consciousness itself, likewise occupies a position structurally prior to sanskaras. The curtain of sanskaras intervenes between pure consciousness and the two bodies, subtle and gross, ca casting a shadow on all beneath and bending the consciousness of mind down into the subtle and gross domains as is represented in figure 27 by the arc linking mind with subtle body. The subtle body of course serves as the arena for the manifestation of thoughts and desires while the gross body provides the vehicle for their enactment. Okay. So where had we gone? Okay, so we're down to the paragraph as the diagram shows. Oh, actually, I think I stopped at former where there was the footnote. Oh. No, we were at Y, figure 27 on the page. Yeah, I mean, Y, you know, we got to figure 27, yeah. Okay. As the diagram shows, each human being has a mind as well as the subtle and gross bodies. Now, what are desires and thoughts? They are nothing other than sanskaras in subtle form. Sanskaras in gross form are actions. Actions are executed through the gross body and desires and thoughts are carried out through the subtle body. What then is the root of thoughts, desires, and actions, subtle and gross? These very same sanskaras, because thoughts and desires consist of sanskaras. There follows the use of the subtle body, and because actions are likewise made of sanskaras, there follows the use of the gross body. So what happens next? What results from this? Because of its sanskaras, mind is bent toward the domains, of the subtle and the gross, that is, towards desires, thoughts, and actions. To use up and spin these sanskaras subtly, mind employs the subtle body.
and to expend its gross sanskaras, it uses the gross body. In both cases, the mind remains engrossed in its subtle and gross sanskaras and does not look towards the Atma. Now, if these sanskaras are wiped off, the mind must need still see something. Why? Because when the mind does so many things in the gross and subtle mediums, necessarily it must do something when it is divested of them. The task then is to retain full consciousness and yet to return to the original state prior to the entanglement with sanskaras. How is this to be done? By retaining consciousness while becoming a stone. At this point, you might be asking, why are we delving into the detailed explanation of all these things? To make the original subject more clear and enhance our understanding of the general theme. So let us turn to the topic of actions first. What should the mind do to destroy its actions? It should follow the related sanskaras. Should allow. Sorry, it should allow the related sanskaras to take their subtle form, but it should not allow them to precipitate into the gross form of actions. That is, at this stage, when sanskaras have emerged in the form of thoughts and desires, the mind should be checked. Nonetheless, the sanskaras still remain. They continue to exist and the mind too remains. To destroy thoughts and desires is exceedingly difficult because mind and consciousness persist. Inevitably, thoughts and desires arise, created from their latency. So what needs to be done is this. While retaining consciousness, one must check one's actions. If the actions are not carried through and performed, then the sanskaras disappear. And one has gone back to the sanskaras free state as described above. On this point, Kabir says, man gaya to jane de majane de sharir. If the mind goes, let it go, but do not let the body go after it. This is probably worth reading the full couplet in the footnote here, if you can see it. Intel Infinite Intelligence, page 442, cites the entire couplet, one of Baba's favorites, thus, man gaya to jane de ma jane de sharir. Na kanak ke ga kaman to kahan la ge ga fear. If the mind goes, let it go, but do not let the body go after it. If the bow is not drawn, how can the arrow strike? Okay. Now for the mind to revert to its original sanskara's free condition and directly see paramatma all desires and thoughts must vanish but this is impractical unless the mind is turned paramatma cannot be seen and this note also is probably worth reading though baba does not explain here what he means by turning the mind a year earlier, on 28th November 1926, he gave an explanation and an analogy to the Mandali in Lanavala that probably bears on this point 
see Tiffin Lectures, pages 321 through 23. Also pertinent is Baba's account in God Speaks, pages 69 to 72, of the turning inward and passage in through the seven openings in the face and the course of one's progress through the five first five spiritual planes. Baba makes frequent reference to this turning in later lectures in this series. Yeah, it's going to be an, a refrain of his in what's coming up. Continuing, so a sad guru needs to be caught hold of and he will help us. turn our mind to check one's actions as we have been describing is comparatively easy but what is the use of that for Austin scars still persist in the form of desires and thoughts thank you elizabeth good job jim wilson can you pick up Try to unmute, please. Unmute. There you go. Yes. Uh, those people who believe in and act according to the Sharia can, at the most, check their actions. But those who progress on into Tariqat can check their desires and thoughts as well. Such a one gets the help of his master who turns his mind. But the chariot, even when followed to the utmost, brings about only the checking of actions. And so it does not provide the real practical help needed on the path. So dear chaps, always keep in mind what every day Sri implants there and presses home to you, that the mind has to be turned the mind has to be turned over and over again. The mind cannot be reversed without the help of a sadguru. And how does a sadguru give this help? Through love to the utmost. Here is another figure or simile just thought out by Sri. In the first three Atma states of stone, vegetable, and animal, the sun goes unseen owing to the darkness cast by sanskaras. In the fourth state of human, morning has arrived, and now the sun must be seen. But here again, this does not happen. The sun remains hidden owing to the clouds of sanskaras. So what is to be done? The clouds need to be shifted aside and out of the way. How is let's, this to be accomplished? Let's take a look at this figure now. I was referring to this particular figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so here on the left, you see the sun, which is God. And uh, you may remember, in fact, I'm going to go back to it uh, since been a while and you guys don't have the actual book um uh, let's see yeah you remember this um these different layers knowledge knowing and ignorance god energy akash real subtle growth tariya movement emptiness these three levels of thing the top one being the real and then the subtle and the gross are here well, this is actually based on the same idea here. If you uh, look at these three levels here, you see Atma, knowing, and most finite form. Those are actually the same levels as we saw in that earlier table and several other places. Remember where all the theoretics of that got explained earlier in this series. Um, so on the top level of Atma, you're above the clouds of Sanskaras because the Atma is the reality. It's actually identical with the ocean of God. 
Thus, you have this A, which is always just the same. We saw that in previous diagrams today. Now, these are the Sanskaras. And uh, the movement is actually from right to left. Stone is in the dead of night. Vegetative forms correspond, or I guess maybe early night, that would be. Vegetative forms would be midnight. Animal forms correspond to the dawn and human form to morning. But even in the human form, as Baba just explained, the sun is not yet seen because the sanskaras are still there. Uh, Jim, do you want to read the key here, which goes over this again? Jim, where'd you go? I lost them. Hold on. <laughs> there you go. All right. The elaborate diagrammatic metaphor compares evolutionary progress from stone through vegetable and animal to human form to the movement of the daily cycle from early night through midnight and dawn to full morning. Darkness corresponds to unconsciousness, while the Son of God is infinitely conscious. Although Atma itself remains unchanged throughout, consciousness symbolized by daylight and correlating with the line of knowing grows and grows. Even after the achievement of full consciousness in human form, however, the human does not see the sun, since the clouds of Sanskaras, which have been accumulating through the evolutionary process, now intervene and block the sun's view. Okay, so now we're coming down to the last end of the lecture. You want to repeat that paragraph? So what is to be done? Uh, so what is to be done? The clouds need to be shifted aside and out of the way. How is this to be accomplished? You need to love me, which means to think of me. And to think of me means not to think of yourself at all. Okay, so that's the end of that lecture. Wow. Okay. Next, next time we'll going back, actually back to evolution again. Is the next one a very long one or? Uh, let me see. It's substantial. I mean, not really long, but what, 5P? It's got a... It's only got two charts, right? Maybe we can do one more? You wanna give it a whirl? Okay, I I'm game, so. sure. The topic will be uh, familiar because he's going back to evolution again. Mm -hmm. All right. Well let, well, let me pause and give people a chance to comment. Maybe maybe some of you are are full. Raise, raise your hand if you don't want to go on. <laughs> I can't see anybody raising their hands. One. So it's only you, Elizabeth, who doesn't want to go on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There is a lot to discuss, but we'll have plenty of time. We've been trying to kind of uh, cover ground because... Uh, <laughs> Time's getting short. Time, we're time running out of time, yeah. Okay. okay we'll do it. Um, let's see, Melissa, you want to uh, pick up again? Continuing the theory of evolution, Shri said... We need to explain two points before proceeding with the chief figure, the main analogy. When we have covered that, our discussion is complete. Over the last few days, we have been reviewing the chain of evolution that extends from atom through human form. On Sunday, we used a doll as a visual aid to illustrate evolution. And on Wednesday, we gave the analogy of the sun obscured from our sight by the cloud of sanskaras. 
These were different similes elucidating the same evolutionary story. Also, in this series of lectures, we spoke about, well, it was moving. We spoke about Atma, knowing in its various degrees, the connection with form and so forth. This too bore on the same theme. Today, we will finish up on this subject of the chain of evolution, clarifying it through another analogy. What we established on Wednesday was that throughout this process of organic evolution, in which the human form becomes completely manifested, Atma remains the same, untouched, unaltered. Then what changes? The forms and the knowing change. That is, the latent human form appears in various shapes, and consciousness increases. And what analogy did I give to illustrate this? Do you remember how I used the cardboard with holes, some smaller and some bigger, through which one peeps? The smaller the hole, the smaller the sight of the object, while the bigger the hole, the bigger the sight and the field of vision. Um, okay, let's come uh, back to this. Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay. In the analogy of the cardboard, seeing means knowing. The evolution through the series of forms is accompanied by an increase in this knowing, just as an increase in the size of the whole brings about a wider expanse in what one sees, and vice versa with a smaller hole diminishing the scope of vision. This was the analogy that I gave along with the other figure of the sun at early night, midnight, dawn, and morning time as illustrated in figure 28. Now, let us consider another analogy illustrating how Atma itself remains the same throughout the course of evolution, while the forms of evolution and the knowing or consciousness change. This is depicted in figure 29 on the previous page. Okay, maybe we could take a look at that. He's going to be using the case of Masaji. And uh, Masaji uh, was one of the Mandali and he was actually uh, Baba's uncle, um, older man. Uh, cook. He was actually the father of Pindu and Naja, for those of you who knew, they're also Baba's Mandali. Um, his, uh, actually, the memorial tower at Maribad, for those of you who have seen it, is constructed right next to the site of the graves of Masaji and Kanji. So uh, this is stages in the life of Masaji. So again, you see Atma, um, so the progression is downward, from the evolutionary series, Baba is still on evolution. So you see that Atma never changes. Knowing, remember how we had knowledge, knowing, and ignorance. So knowing corresponds to the subtle, ignorance to the gross. So knowing, and we used those same colors, dark for ignorance and orange, yellow, bright for consciousness grows and grows and grows through the course of the evolutionary series. The forms are most finite form. This would actually be the, the uh, fourth state of God in God Speaks. Then stone, metal, vegetable, animal, monkey, human. And he's going to compare this to Masaji, newly born, metal, to Masaji, seven days old, vegetable, to Masaji, seven years old, animal, 14 years old, monkey, 28 years old, and human, 56 years old. And then we have this, uh, these numbers, 
So seven days old uh, is one, seven years old is seven, 14, 28, 56, and the total is 106, which he's going to come back to. Hmm. I'm just gonna come up in the next figure too. So do you wanna read that key, Melissa? Key to figure 29. Like figure 28, figure 29 gives an analogy for the evolution of form and consciousness, whose major kingdoms this time Baba compares to the different stages in the life of his uncle and disciple, Masaji. Stone form compares to Masaji when newly born. Metal to Masaji at seven days and so forth. Evolution completes itself in human form, which Baba likens to Masaji at the age of 56 years. Masaji himself remains Masaji throughout. In the same way, Atma itself never changes despite the growth of the soul's knowing in the second column. On the pencil numbers to the right of the figure, see key to figure 30. The sources in explanations present this material in the form of typed columns. The artist editor team has added to the second column through the incorporation of the bar chart, which illustrates the growth of knowing or Chaitanya. So we put that in. So now Baba's going to proceed to give, to explain this. So we're uh, a paragraph, let us, oh, we could read, uh, let's re start by reading the uh, footnote on Masaji. He's gonna play with his name a bit. Rastramana, known as Masaji, was Baba's maternal uncle, husband before her early death to Pila Masi, Sunday, sister of Baba's mother, Shireen, along with his children, Pendu and Naja. Masaji had been one of the resident Mandali since the early 1920s, often serving as night watchman and cook. So I would presume that Masaji was probably there that night when Baba was giving this analogy and Baba would point to him. That's just a guess, but it would make sense. Let us take Masaji as our case study. Compare Masaji when newborn to a stone, which is to say the Atma associating with its most finite form. The knowing too, like the body form, is most finite almost nil. As a newborn, Masaji knows only how to cry. Masaji himself, of course, was Masaji, then the same as now, when he has grown old. Thank you, Melissa. Let's have Sam read for a bit. By the way, just, uh, just a reminder, like, Masaji knows only how to cry. Remember, Bob is giving this as a talk, so probably he would make some expression where you could really see Masaji crying. You know, remember that, that Baba is vividly enacting all of this. Now move ahead to Masaji at seven days old, increased slightly in body size and degree of knowing. In our analogy, we liken this age in the life of Masaji to the evolutionary stage of metal. Advancing our story still again, Masaji at seven years can be compared to the Atma progressed to the stage of vegetable. With the form more developed and the knowing increased. But for all this, Masaji himself remains the same as he ever was. Masaji. Masa did not become Sama. Okay, this is a wordplay. 
explained in the note down here. Okay, uh, Masa in Gujarati means maternal uncle, husband of one's mother's sister. While the root meaning of Sama in the Indic languages is the same, like, similar, equivalent to. Baba appears to be engaged in wordplay here, reversing and scrambling the order of syllables, ma and sa, as a way of illustrating the continuity of underlying identity. Masaji, or the atma, amidst a surface change of form. Perhaps Baba intended the further implication that Masaji did not become Sama, the same, because he never changed in the first place. Okay. Yeah, so we had uh, Masaji, Masa did not become Sama. Masaji, the Atma, is altogether unchanged. Jumping ahead once more, Masaji at 14 years of age, we liken to the animal form, the animal stage in evolution. Just as a boy of 14 knows far more than he did at age seven, so an animal possesses a much higher degree of knowing about himself and his environment than does a vegetable. We come at length to Masaji aged 28 years, whom this analogy likens to a monkey. Just as the Atma in monkey form has advanced in the animal series to its very last stage, by so much has increased the amount of knowing. In Masaji's case, at age 28, he had even mastered the art of cooking, whereas a newborn child, as a newborn child, he did not even know how to eat. Finally, when Masaji arrives at the mature age of 56, he can be said to have achieved the human form with all that much more advancement in knowing. Yet know for sure, that in the eyes of Sadgurus, Masaji has not yet even been born. The day when he turns his mind, turns his eyes from the outer to the inner, turns towards the truth, that will be the day of his real birth from the point of view of the Sadgurus. So all of you know that you are Murda, a dead corpse. You may say as you like that you are so learned and so far advanced and civilized and on and on, but all your words are of no avail. They have absolutely no value. Indeed, all of humanity at large, in spite of its science, knowledge, and civilization, is made up of nothing and no one but the dead. If you really want to live in the true sense, try to turn your mind, as I have been explaining. But how? The mind will not turn through your own individual efforts. This turning is very difficult. Difficult in the extreme. So take the help of a Sadguru, who, when you pay the price of love that he demands, will help you to turn your minds. Now consider the diagram on the next page. Okay. So let's look at this first. Uh, here you have... Dina Baba is gradually, you know, when you talk about turning, he's really talking about entering the path. 
So he's beginning to move towards that topic, which is going to dominate at the end of this. Um, so here you have the six planes of the path. You have the creator point. You have God, seventh plane, and this play with numbers. Baba would play with numbers. There seems, it's led me to think that there is a numerological aspect to reality. Plato and Pythagoras would have said, yeah, man, to that. So one here is, of course, correlating with God. The creator point is zero, right? It's non-existent, and it's also in the form of a circle. And thus, you have the six planes, 106. And once again, we have this series of numbers we saw before. One plus seven plus uh, 14 plus 28 plus 56 equals 106. Apparently, there's some uh, mystical significance to that number. So do you want to read this uh, key? Um, let's see. I was going to ask. Thank you, Sam. I was going to ask Diana, but I think I lost her. Uh, Jim, can you read? <clears throat> key to figure 30. This very simple diagram shows the six planes of the spiritual path, the creator point, and the seventh plane, which is nothing other than God or Paramatma. In this aspect, it exhibits a broad relationship with figure 10. Let me quickly just remind you of figure 10. You guys had the book. It would be so nice and easy. I don't know if you remember this one. Mm. So God unconscious, he says, apart from Ishwar and the path, all else is false. So this diagram completely skipped evolution and reincarnation and just showed the path. Again, I kind of think Baba was really trying to direct the boys upward and uh, not embroil them in topics relating to reincarnation. So this uh, figure broadly has a resemblance with that. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Yet the other element in the second paragraph there. Ah. Yet the other element in this figure is a numeric riddle indicated through the string of numbers at the top that add up to a total of 106. Part of the key is this riddle lies in the analogy of Masaji and figure 29. The number one corresponds to stone and metal, seven to vegetation, 14 to animal, 28 to monkey, and 56 to human. But another part of the number play in figure 30 lies in the three numbers one, zero, and six, making up 106, which correlate respectively to God, the creator point, and the six planes. Right, you remember that? Here's 106, God, mm. the creator point, and the six planes. Wow. Okay, and this is the end of the lecture, I think, right here. In figure 30, the six stages of the spiritual path are found on the lower portion beneath the arc. The point between the sixth and seventh planes, located on the arc itself, signifies the creator point, while the single digit, represented by the number seven in the figure, appears at the top. So if you read from bottom to top, you get one for the seventh plane and zero for the creator point and six for the six planes. That is 106. Reverting to the analogy of Masaji, if you total the numbers from all these stages of evolution, taking all the various multiples of seven together with the initial one, standing for the first period of seven days, the grand total comes 
to 106 as below. 1 plus 7 plus 14 plus 28 plus 56 equals 106. Okay. Well, that's the end of that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me stop the recording. Did you have anything to sum up before I stop the recording? Or? Um, just to reiterate that Baba has really arrived at evolution. Also, uh, he brought up Sanskaras, the first significant discussion on that. And there's actually going to be a little bit more on evolution um, here uh, in the next two lectures. And then he's going to get to involution, the planes, the skies, and the asmas. Okay. Well, thank you, Ward. And thank you, all of the readers. You did a terrific job, as usual. Much appreciated. So in a moment, I will start the second recording. Give me a few minutes to make the transition. Mm.